Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Congressman Golden's listening session focused on small businesses and the coronavirus in Maine. The point of this event is to hear from you, so at any time during the call, um, please press star three. Um, that will give you the opportunity to take your question down and we'll put you in our queue. At the end of the call, everyone will have the opportunity to leave a message for the congressman and we'll make sure you get a timely response from our office. Um, make sure that if you have a chance to ask a question that you try and keep it brief and to the point. That just lets us hear from as many folks as possible. And with that, we'll get right to it and I'll turn it over to Congressman Golden. Well, thank you, Nick, and uh, good good evening to everyone on the call. I want to thank you for joining us tonight and taking time out of your evening uh, to talk with me about uh, what's going on with the economy and small businesses here in Maine. Uh, so far, I have held eight uh, similar events uh, in the last month or so to listen to people here in Maine and to small businesses in particular. Uh, so that we can help connect them with resources like the SBA uh, loan programs that Congress has put forward, uh, the most popular one being the Paycheck Protection Program uh, because it is potentially for forgivable uh, for those people that are able to use it to uh, maintain payroll uh, and keep people working. Um, we're also just doing our best on these calls to answer the questions that you have or, as Nick indicated, get back to you uh, with the answer uh, as soon as possible if we don't have it right now. Um, I, I want to say that, um, you know, the, the purpose of this call for me is to really hear from you uh, as business owners in particular, uh, how are federal programs uh, like the Paycheck Protection Program working for you? Uh, and perhaps more importantly, how are they not working well for you? Or are, are they just not quite the right fit um, you know, I'm looking for the stories from you about uh, the success uh, of this program and helping you continue uh, to operate or to pay your workers or the ways in which you have concerns about it going forward. Uh, so really, this is a listening uh, opportunity for me and an opportunity for you uh, to make sure that you're being heard by, by your congressman. Uh, we're very lucky to have Dana Connors, President and CEO of the Maine State Chamber of Commerce, join us. Uh, I want to thank him for joining me again. Uh, Dana, you've done a number of these and it's, it's very appreciated. Uh, and um, we appreciate having your knowledge and experience uh, on the line with us tonight. Uh, well, thank you very much, Congressman. And, and indeed, the pleasure is mine. Um, on behalf of the state chamber and all local regional chambers around the state, we welcome this opportunity to uh, be a part of your Tele Town Hall to be able to, as you described so well, to listen and to learn. And uh, when we have that opportunity, we not only can gain the knowledge and the experience to fix what isn't working, uh, but to also recognize the value that comes from the programs that exist that are working at this unprecedented challenge that we're all a part of. So thank you very much. Well, so thank you again. And, and I just want to reiterate before we start taking questions here, uh, in just a moment, uh, that the, the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, which is being run through the Small Business Administration or the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, were drafted uh, quickly. Uh, they're not perfect, uh, but they were put together as quickly as possible uh, to respond uh, to the, the needs of small businesses that were being uh, shut down by the coronavirus. Uh, but w that doesn't mean that we can't make an effort in Congress to improve them and upon them uh, and make some fixes uh, based upon the feedback that we get uh, from business owners like, like you all on the line tonight, uh, which is again the purpose of the call. So I look forward to hearing uh, your feedback uh, and answering what questions we are able to, uh, both Dana and I. Uh, and I want you to know that I'll be using uh, the, the input I hear from you tonight uh, to submit uh, suggested changes formally uh, to the chair of the House Small Business Committee. Uh, I'm a, a member of that committee and we'll be seeking to give her some insight into what we need to do to improve upon the response uh, from Congress to help small business uh, owners like yourselves on the line. So thank you very much for your questions and let's get to them. Thanks, Congressman. Um, we've got several questions um, that folks submitted online, but I want to remind anyone who joined us in the last few minutes 
that if you have a question, please press star three. Um, we'll take down your question and make sure you get in our queue. Um, right now we'll go to an online question from Jeannie or Jeanne in Ellsworth. She asks, my business will still be closed by the state of Maine until the end of June, and my PPP will be gone by then, but I will not be able to pay my employees at all, or maybe partially, as it will take months for my business to recover. Can we get more PPP another month? What is Congress doing? Thank you for that question. Uh, I recognize this is a position that a lot of businesses find themselves in, uh, my belief is that when this uh, program, the Paycheck Protection Program, was drafted in the um, Senate in March, probably a lot of people thought that by um, June 30th, we would likely have already seen a lot of the restrictions on businesses lifted and that in addition, uh, you know, we would have gotten through the worst of this pandemic. Um, I think a lot of people now believe that the timeline is m much uh, slower uh, and that we're going to be struggling uh, economically here for much longer. So um, sadly, the program as it was originally drafted uh, by Congress says that a business entity is only eligible for one paycheck protection uh, program loan uh, and not another after that. Um, but I think it's worth revisiting. Um, as time goes on here. So uh, I, I appreciate the feedback. Uh, I've heard this from other businesses uh, and will do what I can uh, to hopefully uh, get some changes for businesses that continue to find themselves in your situation. I want to uh, let people know, uh, do, do not hesitate to uh, please leave your contact information when you talk to my staff tonight. Uh, so that we can follow up with you um, as uh, as quickly as possible uh, to either get more information about the situation you're in or to just get back to you with uh, any updates. We're going to go now to our first live question. Uh, that's going to be Marianne and Tom in Hamden. Go ahead. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm Hello. doing well. How are you? We can hear you. Good. All right. Thank you so much for holding these. We've really enjoyed them. I just wanted to start by saying that. Um, my question that we have is we understand that 75% of the money has to go to the, the our employees, but we are fearful that we are going to have money left over at the end of the eight weeks. We can't seem to get a definitive answer as to whether we could give everybody bonuses um, you know, do something for them at the end. And, you know, because of the lack of hours that they've all had um, due to our business, you know, declining over the last couple of months. And secondly, our biggest thing is that with this PPP, we're able to pay, um, you know, utilities and interest on mortgages and stuff. But what we really need is to pay vendors so that we can get more material to keep in business because a lot of people aren't paying us, so in turn we can't pay them. So that's, you know, that's our biggest problem that we're having right now. Well, Marianne, thank you for, for uh, getting on the call tonight and, and for sharing that. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges for a lot of business owners like yourself is that, as I said at the beginning of the call, this program was really put together uh, very quickly. I think I've heard Dana Connors uh, in past calls say that it was like building, um, it was like trying to uh, take a, a plane off the runway while building it uh, and get it up in the air. Um, and as a result, a lot of business owners have found themselves in possession of a Paycheck Protection Program loan uh, without yet having uh, clarity from the Small Business Administration and the rulemaking process about uh, how they need to uh, Know, what steps they need to take in order to uh, successfully get loan forgiveness, uh, as well as some of the questions like the one you asked about, can we use this uh, you know, to pay uh, some of our workers a bonus at the end of the loan if we have leftover monies? You know, what should we do with it in that situation? Or uh, can we use it uh, with a little more flexibility towards something uh, like 
like paying vendors. So uh, I appreciate that feedback. I don't have an answer for you about whether or not uh, you might be able to use it for other purposes without losing um, the uh, loan forgiveness side, but this is a question that I will seek to get a, uh, an answer and get back to you with. It's, it's just great feedback, by the way. I mean, the entire, I think, supply chain is being impacted. Um, and often I think people think about uh, the business uh, without stopping to think about many of the other businesses and vendors that are important to them uh, that uh, stand behind that business. Thanks. We're going to go now to Michael in Jonesboro. Michael, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um I was one, oh, let's see, I, I applied for EDIL the first time, didn't get it. Apply, I didn't apply for it the second time because I felt like I've already applied for it. But then I heard we're supposed to apply for it again. Is that true, like the third time? This new one that's coming up? I, I, I think that the answer to that, um, to be honest, may depend upon the situation uh, that that you're in. I had heard. Um, for instance, that if you had a, um, did you have like a uh, ID number given to you? Yep. Yep. So in that situation, what I've been told is that uh, you shouldn't have to do anything more, uh, that um, there was a backlog of applications, that the demand uh, was outpacing the supply uh, for the, the uh, EIDL program, and that, you know, we put like another uh, – $50 uh, billion uh, dollars in, into the program or, or enough money uh, to back uh, that type of demand. And people that had like a uh, designated number like you, uh, they will just work towards clearing out that backlog. Uh, I think a more important question for you is, uh, did Congress appropriate enough money to clear out that backlog? Uh, and so unfortunately, I was, my I was thinking the $50 billion was covering it. You well, that. you know, we were thinking it would, but I don't know that we always know for sure. Um, not to mention that once we clear that backlog, uh, there could be, you know, ongoing demand uh, and it might not uh, be enough money. But um, please make sure that we, um, you know, have your contact information. If you don't think we do, um, you can give it to me right now over the phone. But I want to make sure. sure I gave you the right answer, but I think that right now your best bet is to just continue to wait to hear back and certainly stay in touch with your uh, lender. Okay, because when we filled it out, um, it was online, and it was, like, really quick and easy to do. And I think we just typed in the lender's name on there. Yeah, okay. But you did get back, like, a, uh, like a, almost like an application number or something along those lines. Yeah, it was just sort of like a single-page printout with this big, bold number in the middle of it. And it was like, that's it? My wife and I were looking at it going, uh, okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know. and have you tried to call uh, the Small Business Administration in the last couple of weeks? I didn't. Uh, we just – we hadn't heard anything. We just have seen that, you know, all the money's run out, the money's run out. And to us, it's it, just it, like – Oh, if you could call my office here in Lewiston and and ask for um, uh, Kathy, who uh, yeah. is leading my small business uh, task force as we are dealing with this economic uh, crisis, um, we'd love to to follow up with the Small Business Administration on on your behalf. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Um, we're gonna now. Um, Turn it over to, to Dana to hear some of what he's hearing from his local chambers and some of the uh, member businesses that he's working with. Dana, go ahead. Yeah, well, I thank you again for the uh, opportunity. And I think it's fascinating because I think that so much of what I get out of these Tellytown halls is exactly the assistance that is able to be given to people that have those questions that – is really built upon, you know, the question of what do I do and how do I make this work? So I think, Congressman, um, this is a tremendous service that you provide to the constituents, and I commend you for it. I think that, number one, in this, in this round of additional dollars, uh, 310, uh, as well as the 60, the 310 being for the PPP program and the 60, we're not getting um, – 
we're not getting the same concerns that we did in the first instance. That doesn't mean that there aren't some concerns, and I could generally tell you what they would be, but I think there's a reason for that, and as the last uh, caller just uh, sort of spoke to that in in some ways, and that so many people had their application in and the money ran out, so they're they're in the queue now waiting for that acknowledgement. And I think that, again, that speaks to how this program has worked to the benefit of the challenge that we're a part of today. We all we all have to recognize, as the congressman said, that this came together in a week's time. And then then the various departments had to develop rules and regulations. And with those rules, certain changes get done. But in light of all of that, people have really stepped up and, and been able to really make use of these dollars. I would say that what has come forward from the last time around uh, still is there, that a lot of companies would love to get the PPP program, but their needs are more capital intensive, and PPP is really focused on the payroll, thank goodness, because it, it provides that ability to keep people in place. That's an issue that that's there. Um, having the idle loan uh, replenished with dollars can help because that's exactly where it comes from. Uh, the other one is we heard this a lot in the first go-around, is that one of those unintended consequences, I believe, is that you go to your lender, they work with you, they get you approved, and then within a certain period of time, you you have your closing and you you have your cash. But you also have to recognize at that time, your goal is to bring back not all that you can get, but all that had been employed, the full-time employee number, and you got to do that by the end of June, and when you factor in how the unemployment benefits that admittedly do run out in July, but for the moment is an incentive for some to stay furloughed, that all of that, even though it's it's well intended, has caused some concern and some complications for businesses, a little bit of insecurity, if you will, in terms of how do I make this work for me? Again, it's it's not a criticism of the program. Thank goodness that those dollars are available. It's just making it work and making those adjustments, as, as you mentioned, Congressman, as we go forward. But, no, I think overall uh, we're all blessed to have the opportunity to help get us through this very critical time because we all know um, how important – dollars are uh, to meet the needs of our business, both the supply chain, but also our personnel. So that's kind of a, a quick summary of, of what we've heard um, and what we've been witness to. Yeah, I really appreciate that feedback, uh, Dana. One thing I'm doing on the, the Small Business Committee um, is, you know, interesting, uh, obviously a lot of people on the call probably uh, don't know in full the process uh, the legislative process and the uh, rulemaking process that follows even the passage of a new law. Uh, and, you know, it's not their job to know that, uh, those details. Um, that's, you know, my job and, and yours uh, in the chambers. Um, but it is a often uh, slower process but a confusing one. Uh, and in the rulemaking uh, aspect, sometimes uh, we don't see, you know, in that in those rules being put forward, the kind of original intent of Congress. And, and so uh, I want people on the call to know that when it comes to rulemaking coming out of something like the Treasury or the Small Business Administration, Congress can, uh, you know, give inputs from business owners like you and push for changes. We may or may not be successful depending upon uh, the interpretation of the law that's been passed, but I think it's important to try. And, and Dana just made, uh, you know, a good example uh, of rule uh, that has come out, um, you know, having to do with the 75-25, 75, 75 being that 75% uh, of the funds that you um, use for, through this PPP program must be put towards paychecks, which is great because the point of the program is to keep people employed. Uh, but what about uh, a motor coach company, um, which I have spoken to that industry recently? Or, uh, Dana, last time we did one of these mic up in Aroostook County, a logger called in. These are capital-intensive small businesses that might struggle uh, without something like PPP, but 
um, will also struggle to get that loan forgiven. Uh, and there's a lot of concern, uh, you know, for some of these individual types of, of businesses uh, about whether or not this is going to be helpful without some recognition about uh, their kind of specific situation because all, all different businesses uh, find themselves in, in different situations. So, Yeah, um, that is so true. Yeah. We got any more questions, Nick? Yep, we're going to go now to Linda in Farmington. Linda, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Golden, for taking all our concerns into consideration. Um, I run a, a small, well, it's not small, it's a private nonprofit organization in Farmington. We offer services to individuals with intellectual disabilities. We were really fortunate in securing a PPP loan on April 16th. Our bank was incredible, and we're just very pleased to have it. However, the eight-week period is going to be a really problem for us because of the um, stay-at-home order and the essential um, workers' mandates from the governor. We actually had to close our doors because we have over 100 people a day that come in and work with these individuals. So the individuals are all sent home. They can't go to – we offer work in the community and volunteer sites in the community. So it was all community-driven. So we had to close the doors. So there were only three of us working now. I had to lay off 47 people, and this was done in April. We got the PP in March. We got the PPP loan in April, and I thought it was going to really help, and it has. It's helped to, to stay alive. However, there is no way I can hire those people back until um, at least June 1st when the governor just said that we can open the doors slowly and um, – the, the, our eight weeks will be done June 11th. So we're going to have a real problem with having any of it forgiven, and then we're going to have a real problem with making the monthly payments, which are going to be over um, $11,000 a month starting seven months. Is there any way that the eight weeks could be expanded to something longer than that? Linda, that's a, a great question. Um so when you say the the eight weeks being expanded, you mean um, the duration of time that you would be able to um, hold on to those funds and continue to use them uh, so that you would have, uh, I guess conceivably what you're saying is you would then have more time uh, to to hire those people back and actually right. use the towards towards and, the paying their stuff. So that it can be forgiven. Because as it is, we won't be able to hire anyone until June 1. The eight weeks... Uh, will be the amount of time that they're going to uh, calculate how much of it was spent on payroll. That ends June 11th. So I'm only going to have two weeks when I can rehire. So there's going to be a very small amount of people um, in payroll that's going to be able to be forgiven. But if we had 12 weeks, I think the, we'll, we'll be up and running again. So I just think there would by July, I'm pretty sure the governor's going to let us, com I'm hoping, <laughs> reopen completely. Um, because yeah, we don't have over 50 people. I appreciate that. I mean, I think it would probably be even difficult from June 1 to June 30 maybe to get all 47 people back, uh, although that's going to be your goal, I, I imagine. so. Um, well, it is the goal. It's going to be hard because it's the 65 people with intellectual disabilities that are going to be coming back just a few at a time so that we can make sure it's really safe. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, uh, let me, uh, you know, look into this and, and, you know, we'd be happy to, to get back to you. Um, we want to keep pushing for that. And, and you raised a great point that I, I think a lot of business owners are, are aware of, but, um, you know, maybe not everyone out there is. And it's one of my top concerns, which is that if through no fault of your own, as you said, you, you, you can't even open up until June 1, um, you know, you don't know how quickly you'll be able to bring all of your staff or whether all of your staff will want to come back. Uh, and if you don't end up getting loan forgiveness, because it's a 24-month uh, loan term, uh, and you don't have to make any payments for the first six months, so you'll be paying that loan off over 18 months. What I'm hearing from a lot, a big fear from a lot of business owners is if this loan is not forgiven, because I can't quite meet the the uh, full FTE uh, requirement or the uh, 7525 standard, um, it's a very high monthly payment, uh, more than uh, most small businesses or, or certainly nonprofits can handle. Um, and so I'm going to be pushing as well to see if um, if we can't extend something like the eight-week time period, could we potentially um, you know extend the period of time of the loan so that the monthly payments are, are something manageable? Because 
I, I can't imagine that you have a. Uh, it would be it would be easy for you to pay eleven thousand dollars a month on this. Okay, we would have to give. I don't know what we're going to do, but we would have to give the loan back, or and and just I don't know. <laughs> it's a problem. It's a real big problem. That come November, eleven thousand six hundred a month is not going to be there to to pay on this loan. But thank you very much for for the congressman. Um, can... Dana, go ahead. You know, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, this is something that, because of the phase in that currently the state is dealing with and trying to uh, reopen the economy again, is that may be something that we're gonna you're gonna hear frequently. And uh, if there's a service that we could provide by trying to collect some of the evidence and to uh, provide for you the extent of that issue because you are in a very critical position in terms of the small business community uh, uh, committee uh, we'd be more than happy to do that if you think there is value in that oh that'd be incredibly helpful and that's why I'm having the call here and, and you know Linda your your story becomes one of, of many that uh, I'm going to be bringing to the small business committee uh, staff uh, and other members in trying to get some of these uh, issues with with the loan, um, you know, like Dana said, although well intentioned, uh, addressed because uh, I don't want you to be in that situation, uh, you know, six months down the road. Um, and I think that Congress needs to understand that across 50 states we have different strategies. Um, some businesses are already operating, others are not, um, and as a result, it's much tougher uh, for those that aren't to take full advantage of this uh, loan program. So, Dana, that would be incredibly helpful to have every example. Yep. We'll we'll, um, we'll put out a call for that information and try to supply that for you. Linda, please make, sh Linda, please make sure that we have uh, your contact information if you call my office in Lewiston, uh, just so I can make sure that we can reach reach out to you. Go ahead, Nick. We're going to go now to an online question. Um, Julie from Machias asks, when is SBA going to tell us how I can qualify for PPP loan forgiveness? I'm afraid that if I start using the loan I just received before I know all the rules, I might make a mistake and end up with huge payments I can't afford. That's Julie and Machias. Thank you for that question, uh, Julie. Uh, I hope you're doing well. Uh, and I look forward to getting up to Washington County and, and Machias uh, when it's, you know, as, as we get through some of these restrictions. Um, so when the Small Business Administration wrote the first Paycheck Protection Program rules, uh, they, they made clear that they would be issuing further regulations on, on uh, how businesses would meet the criteria for forgiveness. Uh, and, of course, your question is, when are they going to put that out? And that's my question, too. Uh, I joined a uh, call with the administrator of the Small Business Administration last Wednesday evening, along with uh, both Democrats and Republicans on the House Small Business Committee. Um, and uh, we were all pushing uh, for some kind of, of date uh, to be shared with us about when those uh, when that information was going to be given out to lenders and uh, to people who have either taken the loan or who are holding back because they're looking for clarity before deciding whether or not to participate. Uh, and so um, I will uh, reiterate um, to the uh, administrator as well as continue to push uh, the chair of, of the committee to get those uh, rules out to people like yourself as quickly as possible. Uh, but for now, unfortunately, I would say continue to talk to your lender. Um, you know, there are certain criteria out there already, like the 75% uh, requirement uh, that you want to be trying to make sure you're on pace for. Um, but we just got to wait a, a little bit longer here to see what SBA uh, puts out in the coming days or weeks. Great, thanks. We're going to go now to... Michael in Millinocket. Michael, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Congressman. Uh, my question is for you. Uh, I'm the finance officer at the Donald V. Henry American Legion Post 80 in Millinocket. I was wondering what programs there are for a nonprofit organization such as us. Great question. Thanks for calling in, sir, and thanks for your service. Uh, I'm a, a member of the... Uh, American Legion, um, 
I joined the post in Topsom, Maine, even though I'm in Lewiston, uh, just because there was a lot of guys uh, of my generation uh, at that post. Uh, so it made sense to me at the time, of course. And I, I visited uh, the post in uh, Millinocket before. I don't know if you were there that evening, but uh, uh, stopped in and hung out with some of the uh, some of the veterans that were there. Um, um, yes, yes, I was there. We we've met. Yep, yep. And I, I did you ever get the uh, you know, any help with uh, getting that tank fixed up? Uh, no, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> I mean, we 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 got the guidelines for it, but uh, yeah. Uh, you know, for us, and of course, you know the area. You know, it was a mill town, and when that closed, uh, you know, we have a an aging membership and a declining population. So money money's tight, regardless. So with this, you know, everything's uh, everything's a struggle, and I'm just hoping that you know, by the grace of God, and uh, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of donations from from you know our members, which nobody you know it seems like we're always asking for. Uh, hopefully we can keep this post this post going. Well, I'm going to continue to to ask around uh, about money for the tank, and and I want you know, absolutely, um, you know, you know, I'm I'm close with Matt Jabu, uh, the current uh, uh, commander, and uh, I'm going to ask him to check in on you. Uh, the um, the the Paycheck Protection Program actually is something that uh, the Legion is eligible for, but of course that's for you, you got to have uh, employees, so. Um, yeah. You know, a post like yours uh, is unlikely to have that. Uh, so for now, I, I'm not familiar with anything in particular, but um, c- could you give me your number so I can give you a call back? Because I'm going to ask my staff to look around to see if there's something else that might be a better fit for, for a post like yours. Sure. Would you like it now? Yeah, sure. Okay. It's uh, 207. This is my cell number. Yep. Uh, 207-217-1826. All right. Perfect. Thank you. We'll be we'll be in touch. I, I hope we can find something that might help you. Okay, I appreciate it very much, Congressman. And thank, thank you for your service. Thank you for that. All right, we're going to go to um, Teresa from Eastport in just a moment, but I want to remind anyone who's joined us um, in the last few minutes that if you have a question for the Congressman or for Dana Connors, um, to please or, or a comment, we, we also want to hear your, you know, your, your thoughts and your experiences. Um, please press star three, and um, you'll be uh, added into our queue. But now we're going to go to Teresa in Eastport. Teresa, go ahead. Hello. Um, so I think we kind of alluded to some of this with, I think it was Linda's question. But let me preface this with, we appreciate what the government is doing. But Maine is definitely in a different situation with the forest restrictions of quarantining for 14 days, with um, the phases that Governor Mills rolled out. We have a one-size-fits-all program with the federal government between the PPP, the EIDL. How do different states really play into this when we're doing such different things? We used to live in Texas. Texas is already starting to reopen. We kind of feel a little forgotten here. Um, we haven't even gotten self self-employed um, unemployment yet. How does that all factor in? Mm. Teresa, thank you for uh, that feedback. And did you um, end up using either PPP or EIDL? I get into too much because we're in a really different situation. Um, We are a husband and wife team that owns a small business that has three different facets. Um, So it's been really hard for us because of that. We have no employees. We were able to get something from EIDL and something from PPP, and that's great. But there's a lot of other people in Washington County that aren't getting anything. Yes, yep. Well, that's that's helpful. And and by the way, I I know that the... uh, rollout of the unemployment insurance for uh, sole proprietors and the self-employed and and contractors was frustratingly slow. And, um, you know, in part, uh, I I would say the federal government was slow in getting the rules out to the states. Uh, And then, you know, it has taken too long at the state level as well. And and that is only opening up for eligibility for people like yourself on Friday. So, you know, if you're 
situation where you need that, um, please, um, you know, reach out to us and, and we can try and be helpful. Um, I, I think your feedback is, is spot on. It's part of what I was saying earlier, and I'm sure Dana has something to say about it as well, but um, a one-size-fits-all approach doesn't work across 50 different states with different levels of timelines for reopening um, their businesses, their their economy, not to mention not every state had the same levels of restrictions to begin with, although I think most of them had um, some form of non-essential businesses closed, uh, a different mixture of essential businesses open, uh, and, and stay-at-home orders um, at one point or another. Uh, but even beyond that, uh, just the differences between different industries, I think, is significant enough that the program needed more flexibility than what it has, uh, which is why I'm continuing to, to push on the rulemaking side to get some changes to some of these problems that you've um, heard expressed. I don't know uh, what kind of difficulties you might have run into with PPP, but uh, I know for some sole proprietors, um, like S corporations, they were really capped on how much they could even apply for in regards to uh, the size of the loan, and to the point for some that it wasn't even worth um, asking for that help. And I, I thought that was a problem that needed to be addressed. But um, thank you for the feedback, and, and uh, just know that I agree with you. And um, you know, we'll we'll do anything I can to improve the program. But Dana, any any thoughts? Yeah, I I do. I think Teresa brings up an issue that. Uh, is concerning to all of us. The governor has come out um, er, this week, um, yesterday, as a matter of fact, with um, her plan to open up, uh, re-enter the, the economy of the state in four different phases. And one of the areas that has um, that she speaks of has, is really hits the tourism uh, industry very, very hard. And, and as you know, Congressman, there's 36 million people that come to our state during the course of the year. And um, the key months are the very months that that we're about to begin uh, going through the summer. And a good part of our population that makes up those 36 million come from out of state. And so we're working with the administration to try to address that element of the effort, uh, which is the two-week quarantine, because if that occurs, it will discourage people from coming, just as uh, Teresa implied. And we have met with the administration, we've expressed our concerns, and she she welcomes our participation. And I think that what we're trying to do is to um, look at the plan and find those things that work well when they do and in those areas that have a problem such as this that we bring it to their attention and try to seek try to seek resolution and that is that two week uh quarantine is a real impediment and uh we're working with them now trying to do something the other that uh the other item that Teresa spoke to and it didn't receive a lot of attention but it clearly opens the door for earlier uh, re-entry into the economy, and that's the regional effort. There's a recognition. Uh, guidelines will be developed, uh, but there's a recognition that that we're not all we're not all the same when it comes to the impact. That there's parts of our state, the part that I come from, Arista County, or where um, Teresa is from, have lower incidence. Uh, the density is is less, and so that there's a real opportunity for those regions to re-engage in the economy earlier and not have to wait and um, and take the same entry as a community or a region that has much more density and more incidence of the coronavirus. So that opens the door for opportunity, and we want to work uh, for places like Eastport, uh, like Prescott, like other parts of Piscataquis County where those conditions are the same. So on one opens the door for an opportunity on the other we we're working to try to uh to try to deal with that two week quarantine but she's spot on it, it it is something that we have to deal with and when you look at it along with the uh, other regulations that are part of the federal dollars as much as we love those dollars they have to be taken into account uh, the impact that one has with the other so oh, thank you well Teresa, i just wanted to let you know one thing i'm pushing for is uh rather than 
trying to have flexibility built into the program by state because the program is being uh, implemented by a federal uh, department um, is instead to look at uh, essential versus non-essential designations. So uh, a business that has been deemed essential that still needs some help from something like the Paycheck Protection Program because let's face it, the, the entire economy has been very negatively impacted. Uh, you know, it's going to be a lot easier for them to meet the requirements of the program uh, and, and get uh, portions or all of that loan forgiven. But if you're a non-essential empl uh, uh, employer uh, or business, that's not your fault. That's a designation that's been assigned to you by a governor uh, somewhere in the country. Um, and it, as you pointed out, it, it makes it very hard for you to comply with the terms of, of the program. So I think that the flexibility should be in... Um, you know, looking at businesses and whether or not they are currently operating and allowed to operate, uh, if they're partially constrained uh, and, and maybe they're closed but able to do like takeout like a restaurant or a business that just is completely shut down. And I think that they should have uh, each of them some flexibility um, or d a different set of requirements and that's something that I'm advocating for. Um, Dana, you, you know I've talked about uh, the need for every different industry to be trying to come up with uh, safety measures uh, and building plans to hopefully go to the governor's administration and advocate uh, for the ability to open up by demonstrating uh, that they thought through the safety measures and are ready to take the necessary steps uh, to protect the, the community. Uh, and then hopefully, you know, we're going to see an ability to speed up that timeline. Yep, absolutely. That's well said because this is such an unprecedented challenge that it's not trite, nor is it a slogan to say that we're in this together, because indeed we are. And uh, when people find uh, fault or concern with an area, with an issue, then it's up to us uh, to be sure that the administration knows about it and that we work with them to try to have the best fit and fix for the issue. And as you said, Congressman, the whole issue of how do we deal with the safety uh, responsibilities, social distancing, hygiene, and so forth, that, that's the responsibility that uh, as business sectors, we need to step into that arena. And we, we know, particularly like at the restaurant or retail, you know that sector, and we should be putting forward, and they are, no question, those types of considerations that help comply with the safety and public health requirements. Absolutely. It is about all of us. Thanks. We're going to go now to Jenna from Rumford Point. Jenna, go ahead. Sorry, I had to unmute. So we were very lucky in that we received both PPP funds and our EID loan have both funded. But my business is in the business of supporting events. We own our own events. And we support events like Try for a Cure, the Maine Marathon, the Sugarloaf Marathon. None of that's going to happen likely this year, maybe late fall. And I'm concerned that EIDL loan, if we, we accepted all of it, we can give it back. It's a significant loan. will be more debt than my company has ever had. We built our company on revenue and with very small capital purchases over the years. And like the first caller, it's really hard to – um, to understand, you know, what's going to happen in two or three months when we don't open up and my business isn't operating. We will keep, we've kept our staff on and we'll keep them busy. We understand the purpose of the PPP loan is that we don't lay them off and then have a, a, a slower time to bring them back later that we, we kept people working and we hope that we can get some revenue trickling in for some events, but I don't see us starting up possibly until maybe October, September if we're lucky or October, maybe not until winter or next spring. So what's the next step? You know, can we, you know, will PPP be renewed or what happens for businesses that don't come back in the same way? We will come back eventually, but a mass gathering of, you know, two, three, four thousand people is something that I think people are going to be afraid of and not something that's going to come back. So we're looking for what's the long-term solution when we all of a sudden, you know, if we keep the money and stay alive, which is possible, but we'll end up with more death than we've ever had. And one last thing, I, you know, we, we want, I want to thank Congressman Golden and 
for, for taking the time. I've been on a lot of calls um, listening in, and Kathy in his office has helped us a lot through the process. So I just want to say thank you. Well, thank you. Um, you know, it's it's. I feel blessed to to be um, able to um, at least be fighting to to help people like yourself, and and hopefully improve upon these programs. And um, the story you just told is is, is really helpful. Um, um, because I, I don't, I don't think Congress, when they have, when they were drafting uh, the PPP back in March, was really envisioning that there would be some uh, sectors that might be closed uh, for as long as, as um, you know, what you, what you are facing. Uh, I think you mentioned that you support, um, you know, venues of thousands of people, um, and right now we can't even gather in a group of greater uh, than ten. Um, and the guidelines put out by the state, I think, don't even grow to greater than 50 uh, until July. Um, and, um, you know, beyond that, we don't know when we might have, like, a concert venue or something. And even if there were no government restrictions, there's the fear factor. Um, you know, is the public ready? Uh, and, and do they feel safe uh, to go to a, uh, a football game? or to a concert, and we just don't know the answer to that. And so I think Congress needs to be thinking about uh, the types of businesses uh, in, in the you know, sectors uh, in our economy uh, that um, you know, rely upon uh, the answers to those questions before they're able to, to get going again. So uh, I will keep, um, you know, I, I'm just going to sit down, uh, write down uh, your specific example and, and bring that back to the committee with me. So I think what's next is that Congress needs to have a conversation about, okay, which business sectors are open uh, and, and doing better uh, and which ones are, are still unable uh, to operate because of um, government restrictions. Because really, it's this is an unprecedented, I think, um, in many ways, um, form of government action where we are stepping in to offer these forgivable loans to businesses. And that's because uh, the restrictions that close down many are also coming from the government. So there's a shared responsibility. And uh, I'm sorry that you're in this situation. And, and I'll um, continue to advocate that Congress do more for those business owners who continue to uh, be unable to operate. Thanks. We're going to go now to Holly and Ellsworth. Holly, go ahead. Hello. First, thank you so much for doing these. They've been really informative. Um, my husband and I are both, we each own our own businesses, so we are completely dependent on that. Um, a lot of my questions actually were answered, but if it's okay, I'd still like just to make a comment, just to throw out there. Um, my husband just got the PPP loan approved, and we're a little nervous about it because with his business in particular, he's a sole proprietor, and there's no guidelines on how he can show that's being used for our you know, pay replacement. And with, I just wanted to throw out there where he's in construction type business and we are in the Bar Harbor area. So he's obviously not going to get much of a summer income because he does work for hotels and um, a lot of the tourist type attractions. Um, a two year paying off this loan, if that end, ends up what we have to do because we can't show it where we don't have payroll, it's very nerve wracking because it's going to take us years to recover financially um, if we lose a summer season. So I just wanted to throw that out there as, you know, if there's any way to extend the term of the payback if we are put in the position that we have to pay it back. We're a little nervous about that. Thanks for calling in, Holly. That's, that's one of my top concerns. I think you may have heard me earlier say that for those businesses that may not, because of the, the special circumstances they're in, uh, may not be able to uh, achieve um, full loan forgiveness, the 24-month loan term um, paid back over 18 months because uh, you don't have to make any payments for the first six months is resulting in some pretty high monthly payments uh, that I think um, first of all, some businesses are concerned. They're telling us they wouldn't even be able to make that payment um, if they find themselves um, in that situation. And then, like you said, just for others, the kind of quick turnaround, um, especially if you've lost an entire season uh, this summer, uh, it just will make it hard for you to, to rebound um, in an already tough uh, environment to, to recover from. So 
um, I, I appreciate your sharing that, and, and um, I would just say that um, extending the term, like the length of the loan, is something that I'm looking into as a possible solution uh, to help give people more of a um, runway for recovery, um, having used the loan program, or um, to, in an effort to make that monthly payment a little bit more manageable uh, for those who are, are really concerned about that. Thanks. We are we're about to go to um, Major Beal in Jonesport, but it looks like he dropped off the line, so I'll ask his question for him. Uh, it says, my whole family are fishermen, self-employed. Can they apply for PPP? Can it be forgiven? And how do they document what they pay themselves? That's uh, Mr. Beal in Jonesport. Thanks for calling in, uh, Mr. Beal. Uh, so the answer is that fishermen are eligible. Um, as self-employed individuals, you can apply for the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, how you document what you pay yourself, I can't answer right now. I think the devil is in the details of how you have formed your business. Are you like a pass-through entity? Are you, um, you know, how have you set yourself up? Um, and you know, sometimes even like for like S corporations, I have found depending on you know how much revenue there is, uh, after all is said and done, can really limit uh, the effectiveness of this program in particular. And it's not a good fit for some people, but it is for others. Uh, so uh, I hope um, you know if, if I guess you dropped off the line, but if you happen to uh, listen to this after the fact, I know we post this. Uh, that you'll reach out to us, uh, or maybe we can Nick do some work to try and find uh, Mr. Bill. Uh, there's a lot of fishermen in uh, Jonesport, uh, but there's not that many, so uh, I'd like to connect with him because I think we might be able to answer his questions with some more specific details. Definitely. Um, we'll go now. Yeah, you know, like, actually, we'll remind folks that. Um, if you would like to ask a question or um, leave a comment for the congressman about how these programs are affecting your business, um, please press star three and we'll, we'll make sure that you're in our queue. Um, we're gonna go to an online question now, which is from Sean in Presque Isle. He says, I am worried because the news is telling me we might be in and out of social distancing type measures until there's a vaccine. Is anyone out there, like the chamber, helping businesses think through how, that's his emphasis, we change or adapt to be successful if this is a long-term solution, situation, pardon me. That's Sean in Presque Isle. Yeah, let me, let me um, take that because it was directed to um, the chambers in general. Yeah, the, the state chamber along with local regional chambers are working closely with um, the state government, the um, the CDC, uh, as well as the DECD, and and that whole issue that there are guidelines that will be prepared. I think the commissioner said today um, or at the very latest tomorrow regarding the face clothing uh, covering, and um, th that's to begin with. And as you probably have seen, that that's uh, is going to be required as part of the the governor's plan uh, to address those in public settings where social distancing is, is a problem. But to answer your question more specifically, yeah, we, we recognize that, that to really be effective, public health includes the social distancing, the hygiene, all those requirements, including gatherings, that will uh, address the need for, uh, for public health and safety um, security. So yeah, we're working very closely with him and we submit our information to local and regional chambers who've been part of our efforts. So in many ways, if you want to, in the same way that the Congressman has suggested, if you want to uh, submit your, your name to the state chamber uh, for contact, I'll get back to you as these things arise and uh, be sure that you as well as your local chamber receives the information. But it's, it's certainly a concern, an issue, and it's front and center as far as we're concerned. Yeah, you know, Dana, I think that's such an important role for, for the state chamber and, and all the uh, regional ones as well uh, to, to step up and, and be talking to business owners in their community. 
uh, in doing the, you know some educational type work together to figure out how can um, you know each business uh, come up with social distancing uh, you know measures yep. and other things. I mean, you go into businesses now, you see uh, that there are these uh, you know plastic uh, shields up in between uh, you know cashiers and uh, customers. There's you know tape uh, on the ground marking out six feet of distance to avoid jammed up lines. Um, and I, I just think the chamber is in a good spot to help business owners think through uh, because every every business um, is different. I mean, there's, um, you know, you got big box stores where the layout is the same, but for smaller ones, really, you know, they, they're always going to have really unique uh, situations. And, um, you know, I'm, I've looked at, like, um, I've, I've talked to some industries uh, or associations who have worked together to put together um, you know, some kind of plan on how businesses can adapt for the future. Um, and then they've taken that, you know, either through the chamber or themselves to uh, the governor's administration to make a case, uh, you know, to demonstrate that they have a plan and that they're ready. Uh, and I hope that other businesses will be a part of that, um, you know, like you said earlier, working together so that we can get this economy fully opened uh, as soon as possible. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Congressman, because in addition to the chamber being kind of a medium to provide information and resource and to answer questions as well as to work with local businesses, you also have in the state, just as you pointed out, associations. So, for example, there's a retail association, there's a grocer's association, um, hospitality, and every one of those sectors, and they are the ones that are kind of in that in that risk area because they are classified as non-essential. Um, so, but they've all stepped forward and provided the type of information, criteria, conditions as to how each of them, because they are different, the retail needs may be far different than restaurants, how they go about uh, making sure that they meet every standard and comply with the safety regulation. So that's, that, too, is a real resource, and we work very closely with them. So we do, um, we do see the value in that relationship and how it helps us keep in, you all informed uh, throughout the state. So thanks for reminding me of that. Thanks, Dana. We're going to go now to Stu from Holton. Stu, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Congressman, for doing this. It's quite helpful. Uh, my question regarding, uh, was regarding the disaster loan program. Uh, at the moment, uh, you can't apply for it. Uh, I was listening to a talk show on public radio, and they said that um, the very few people have received it. The funding for it is uh, kind of ambiguous as to how that gets allotted compared to the PPP. And uh, do you need to go apply for that loan with a lender's help, or can you do it as just entering it into the SBA site? Well, um, Stu, the first thing I would say is that you're, you're correct that the SBA website is not uh, currently accepting applications. Uh, for the economic injury disaster loan, and that's because the SBA has paused uh, applications until it is certain that it has enough funding uh, to um, approve or dis you know dis dis well to fund the current demand. Um, I think if you were on the call earlier, I was talking about how there was only about. Um, Ten billion dollars put into the EIDL uh, early on, and very quickly the demand um, exceeded that supply uh, of revenue for that program, and so SBA shut off the um, you know ability to apply for more online, and they're not going to open it back up until they have worked through the backlog of people that had already applied, um, but there wasn't enough funding, um, so. I would say you don't necessarily need a lender uh, to apply for for that uh, particular program, but you need to continue to visit the SBA website uh, or um, continue to maybe reach out to my office uh, for updates to see whether or not SBA has opened that back up, and we will be asking them uh, to give us a heads up uh, before 
uh, they open that program back up. That's assuming that they do. Um, Congress believes that we gave enough money uh, last week to the program to fund the backlog and hopefully open it back up. Um, but if that's not the case, then I'm sure in the weeks ahead, Congress will be talking to the SBA about whether or not there is a need for more funding. Um, and in the meantime, uh, y if you're interested, you know, you may look into the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, which, as you noted, does have a little bit more stability right now. Um, and ap the applications are um, currently open, and, and um, you could apply for that. Thank you. Uh, the other question I wanted to ask uh, are, is there any more detail of where this money is going? Uh, as you saw in the first one, there was a quite a bit of money going to organizations that really didn't have a need for it. And is that going to continue, or is there any uh, terms in the new package, too, that is going to help that? Or are we at the mercy of the administrators? Um, it's a little bit of both, Stu. So um, in this last round of funding, we set aside uh, about $60 billion of the $310 billion. It could only be uh, um, given out through uh, some of the smaller lenders, um, you know, like credit unions or uh, CDFIs uh, and some other non-traditional lenders. Um, to try and ensure that that money was more of that money uh, was getting to uh, you know smaller businesses and in particular the types who were struggling to access the program. Um, so that was one step that Congress took uh, in you know affirmatively last week uh, to make sure that uh, we were getting the money where it was needed most. Uh, I would also say that there has been a lot of pushback uh, because. I mean, first of all, the, the bill was drafted in, in the Senate, and I was concerned uh, to see that it was eligible to, um, you know, entities that aren't otherwise deemed small businesses under normal circumstances. But I also recognize that, uh, you know, a, a franchise business in Maine um, is, is, you know, very much in the same kind of um, situation, um, perhaps deemed, um, you know, able to be open, but, you know, not for foot traffic, only for drive through and, and so they're seeing losses of revenue, and at the end of the day, we are trying to protect uh, their workers uh, by keeping them paid. Um, but there's no doubt there's been some abuses. I mean, there, there have been companies that, um, you know, companies are basically self-attesting that they have been negatively impacted by uh, the coronavirus, and that's why they need this assistance. And there have been some who may have other um, means of acquiring the capital they would need. Let's say, like, uh, uh, I, the most recent one I saw was Nathan's Hot Dogs, uh, a, a big national chain that could probably turn elsewhere and use some of their assets that they have uh, to get a loan to keep paying their workers. And, and they didn't need this program specifically. So the the treasurers, uh, the treasurer uh, in the SBA have been, publicly pressuring a lot of these companies uh, to give the loans back, uh, particularly the ones that have really, I think, abused the program by taking out 10 or $20 million, uh, which was more than they needed to begin with, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but so far, Congress has been left in the dark about where each of these loans is, is going and to whom, um, where we've seen a company like Nathan's or uh, some people have talked about Shake Shack, uh, got a lot of coverage. Um, where, where we've learned about them was through SEC filings. And so one of the earliest things I did uh, was write a letter uh, to the uh, Small Business Committee uh, chairwoman saying that I wanted to see uh, real-time reporting from the Small Business Administration uh, you know, at a very granular level about where these loans are going. Um, you know, perhaps we don't need to see the, the you know, um, every little specific detail, uh, but at least have a sense of the size of, of these companies um, and, you know, how they're affiliated in order to try and uh, root out some of the uh, uh, abuse that we've seen with some of these bigger companies. Um, so for now, I would say continue to watch uh, because I think a lot of them are thankfully returning uh, these uh, loans so that we can get it to smaller businesses that need it. 
Um, and uh, I think that's important work, but I think Congress has to uh, ramp up the oversight uh, and, and push a little harder to make sure that the money is um, not going to people that don't truly need it. Great. We're coming up on our last few questions here. We're going to go now to Stacy in Madawaska. Stacy, go ahead. Hi there. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I own a small baseball in the same building that I live in, so I'm a sole proprietor. Um, I didn't qualify for the PPP loan, so I'm one of those people that got the bold letter uh, with all the numbers that I've applied for my EIDL loan. Uh, does that make me qualify to apply for unemployment on Friday, or is that considered double dipping? That is not double dipping, and you can um, you can do both in the situation that you're in. Um, obviously, the Paycheck Protection Program, um, you know, is different. It's meant to um, you know keep people uh, on payroll. Uh, I have right on. I have no payroll. I don't pay myself payroll. Yeah. Yes. Um, and and so. Um, so you're like a – are you filing as like a pastor entity? A sole proprietor? A D yeah. DBA, yeah. yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. So um, I guess what I, I would say is with the EIDL, when when they offer that um, to a, a business like yours, it's out of recognition that you've been impacted by a disaster. Uh, often, you know, we think of that as like a hurricane, in this case, a novel virus. Um, and um, – you you have a lot of latitude on what you would use that for. You could use it to pay vendors. You could use it to pay other bills. Um, you know whatever the um, needs of your business are, um, and you also have like a pretty extended period of time, even f from when they approve you for that loan, to choose whether or not to even uh, close on that loan. Uh, I think up to six months once you've been approved, you can just wait, um, and you can ultimately even choose not to uh, close on that loan if you decide you don't need it. Uh, and so that should not in any way prevent you at this time from applying for uh, unemployment uh, insurance on Friday. Great. Um, we've got one more question, but uh, before we do that, I want to remind everyone that uh, if you didn't have a chance to ask your question, I think we have a pretty long queue of folks still. Um, if you uh, at the very end of the call, you'll have the opportunity to leave a message, um, which we will, um, our staff will uh, get back to you in a, in a timely manner. Um, so we will, uh, we will hear your question and, and, and respond. Uh, but right now, we're going to go to Dee in Auburn for our last question. Dee, go ahead. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I actually have three questions, and I'll try to make them quick. So I applied for an SBA loan. Um, really early on in the process, um, it's the disaster loan. Um, it's actually, it was fairly easy, and automatically it said $10,000. Um, and I have the thing here, it has an application number, and it says you will not receive an email. You will notify you through email um, when we are processing your application. We expect it for it to take a week. It's been four weeks. I own a small business in Auburn, Maine. It's a salon. Um, I've owned it for 18 years. And truthfully, um, being a business person that I am, if I look at my numbers, I probably should be closing my doors. Um, but like, then again, you know, you don't you don't want to do that. Um, I have employees that I care about, and so. I'm just looking to see um, how these loans actually work. Um, I also did receive another email um, prior to that the money, when the money had run out, and they asked me, um, if you already sent in your application, please do not apply again. Um, I have an application number, have received nothing, and now I've been given permission to open. Um, and it's a little scary when you're a few thousand dollars um, behind in rent. Um, you need inventory um, and also to support your stylist that you're bringing back. So not knowing what all that looks like, 
Um, what it looks like to me is that I'm going to get behind my chair and I'm going to work long hours. There's no double booking. Um, and it looks like I'm going to stand behind my chair for the next um, probably month just to make the money to pay my workers, get caught up on my rent, um, pay the disconnection phone bills, um, pay your city taxes. I mean, it just it just goes on and on. So with that, any if that was the information given to me on the SBA, is there still hope that something will be coming in? Is that a reality, or is that is that something? So, I see, that, that, uh, I'm glad you called in and shared that uh, experience. And, and stay on the line in case you, you had any more um, questions. Um, but um, first, I, I don't know if you've called my office in Lewiston, um, but I want to uh, ask you to if you haven't, um, and, and the number is... Uh, 207 241 6767. And if you could ask for Kathy, uh, she's doing great work uh, and she will work with you. Um, uh, she's listening in right now uh, and she'll work with you. Uh, so she'll already have uh, a little bit of, of what's going on um, uh, to try and get some answers. But uh, what I want to um, say is that. You have the app number. Uh, the program was underfunded. Uh, SBA came back to Congress and asked for more, and they believed that it was enough uh, to clear out the backlog of applications like yours for EIDL. Uh, we passed that additional funding just last Thursday into law, so it hasn't quite been a full week, um, and I know it's already been too long, but I would continue uh, to wait uh, on that EIDL because they should be working through that. And, um, you know, in the meantime, your being allowed to reopen isn't going to impact your eligibility for the EIDL program. Uh, and it, it is specifically to help people who have been through disasters do things like restock their inventory, pay bills that have, they've fallen behind on, uh, and such. And so, I think it's still a good option for you, uh, but please reach out to us, um, you know, so we can, can see if there's other ways that we could be helpful. Absolutely. You know, I just, going into this, I'm a little scared that I should have made the decision maybe a couple weeks ago, but I want to stay strong and move on, well, but I, I want to keep going, putting my family deeper and deeper into debt. Well, I, I think you've got the, uh, the the right spirit for it, uh, and, and you're going to keep fighting. So, uh, you know, um, I, I can picture you uh, going out there, like you said, and standing behind that chair and, and working uh, to keep the business going. So um, reach out to us. We want to help. Uh, I know you also had a question, uh, I think, about uh, finding out where to go to find where you register uh, for um, – the checklist uh, on how to comply uh, with the requirements for you to be allowed to um, be open as a salon business. And Dana, have you heard anything yep. from the governor's administration about that? Yes. So I yes. They, um, the commissioner today at the press conference indicated that that would be posted. She indicated later today on their website. So I would be pretty sure that by tomorrow, uh, even giving them the extra time that there'll be something on the state website, the ECD's website, that will provide you with that information. Can I have the is it the website again? Is it the economic? Well, it'd be the yeah. If you went to Maine State State Gov and then went okay. uh, went to the ECD, you would you would find their website absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah. So they had given us permission to open by uh, on Friday. Right. Uh, but then listening today, they said the badge wasn't a requirement, but the, um, the filing and getting the checklist and making sure you can follow it is required. Um, yep. And I just wanted to make sure that I had that in hand. So this, the next question um, kind of goes along with that one. So we are reopening um, our salons, 
but our supply stores are closed. Um, so the supply stores locally are closed. I mean, I have a distributor out of New Hampshire that um, I use because we're a Paul Mitchell focus salon that I could order from, um, not knowing if they're open. I know they've been sending products to our clients that want it. Um, I don't know what level they're on to be able to ship it to me, but I have a message out. They'll get back to me. Um, but we have a couple stores locally right here in Auburn, which would be two of them, Salon Centrix and uh, Cosmopros, um, that they, I was just wondering, I think it's there until June, if they could do some curbside pickup or, I mean, I, I already do with them um, some, a couple times a week. If I'm running low on supplies, I call, I give them an order, I pay for it over the phone, and I have one of my stylists go pick it up. Um, so I find it really difficult um, at this point to be low on supply and not be able to have a supply store to go to. Is there any concern? I, I just think they might have missed the the whole mechanism of the salon and where they get their supplies from. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. Go ahead, Dana. Well, I was going to say, um, you know, the um, the commissioner more than once in our discussions with her she's very accessible she's very helpful and um, she recognizes that this is evolving and that uh, she has mentioned that if businesses that aren't necessarily in that phase that's been described but uh, have those safety requirements and those considerations regarding public health in place uh, they should reach out to her. So I would say that that if if you could send um, or reach out, uh, leave a message for the commissioner, uh, she's probably going to assign somebody, if not doing it herself, because like I said, she's very accessible, to, to answer those questions and try to help, particularly if there's a business that has prepared itself but is just not noted in the descriptions that have gone out already. Uh, I would definitely uh, reach out because I think you'll find somebody who is uh, willing to work with you. Yeah, and Dee, um, when you talk to Kathy, um, ask her to um, work with you on that because I, I'm sure she'd be uh, happy to help you reach out to uh, someone at DECD about that. And, you know, one would think if, if your um, local suppliers are willing to work with you, um, that they might be able to get some kind of permission for something like um, like a curbside uh, pickup yep. or something like that. Yep. Yep. Great. That's our, uh, that's our last question for the evening. Um, I'll turn it over to Congressman Golden um, to say some, to say some uh, closing words and, and maybe Dana Connors as well. Oh, well, I, I just w want to, um, Thank everyone for calling in and, and uh, reiterate that this is very helpful to me as I uh, continue to uh, advocate for more funding assistance through PPP and other programs for small businesses, but also as I uh, continue to give feedback to uh, you know the SBA, but also other members of the Small Business Committee about how some of these programs are well intentioned, uh, but you know at times falling short or needing some potential changes in, in flexibility. So um, I get a lot out of your willingness to participate in these calls, and, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, and I want to ask everyone, uh, if, if you have other questions or needs, reach out to my offices. You'll find um, you know numbers to our office in Lewiston, Bank, or Caribou on my website. Uh, and we have set aside... Uh, a specific small business response team of people that, that they are looking to help people like you. So uh, reach out to us, uh, call, email. Uh, we have a sm special email, the small biz response team at mail.house.gov, and that's uh, S M A L L B I Z response team at mail.house.gov. Um, Dana, I'm going to turn it over to you for the, for the last word uh, here, but I want to thank you uh, for continuing to do these with me and also 
just for everything that you and the chamber are doing as well um, and what you're going to do in the in the months ahead uh, to help our business community uh, in this entire state. Well, Congressman, thank you for those kind comments. And um, let me simply say uh, with all the sincerity in the world that it was a pleasure uh, to be a part of these town hall meetings. And I can tell you that in listening to the people who call in, it is a tremendous service uh, because of of your the answers you give, the access you provide, and your willingness to work with them. Um, I, I think it's a tremendous service, and I know that every one of those of those callers deeply appreciated it, and so don't I. It's been a real pleasure to work with you. As always, you take care, and all of you on the line take care as well. <laughs> Thanks, folks. Um, and one more reminder to uh, stay on the line to leave a voicemail for the congressman and our staff. Thanks for your time. Have a good night.